As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. Free to be you. Free to be you. This is Alex. I've just read a book about Alex, who's a minister in the United Reformed Church. And they're in their late 20s, grew up in Scotland, and the son of a pastor. Alex is married with two dogs. Clearly, not married to, married with two dogs. Clearly has a vibrant faith. And reading through the book, really theologically astute, I would say. Really on the ball. Alex was registered as female at birth. Because the doctors would, because of the genitalia. But life isn't always as straightforward as that, is it? From a very early age, Alex identified more as masculine. In the book, Alex describes some really, really difficult memories. For example, at primary school and secondary school, the taunting, the social exclusion, the bullying, because Alex did not conform to the expected stereotypes of being a girl. Alex's is also a beautiful story, absolutely beautiful, full of hope and a walk to freedom. Freedom to live as Alex is, transgender. Transgender. Trans. Trans as a prefix to a word, the beginning of a word often means something like to move to the other side, as in transatlantic going across the Atlantic. Transfer or change. Transgender is a term that includes the many ways that someone's gender identity can be different from the sex that they were assigned at birth. Another phrase, the term gender dysphoria, is used to describe the deep unhappiness and anxiety transgender people often feel because of the mismatch between their bodies and their gender identity. I felt distressed as a two, three-year-old being dressed as a girl because I knew I wasn't. Sometimes people are dressed in conforming to the sex that they appear and they feel that kind of distress that I felt because it is not them. And so from transgender to transfiguration, this change to Jesus on the mountain where he spoke with Elijah and Moses as witnessed by Peter, James and John. I call them the PJs because that's who I remember who went up on the mountain with him. But here they saw their clearest revelation to date of who Jesus is and was. A spectacular, brilliant display of Jesus' glory Jesus' divinity in this brilliant white. His face glowing. And I think the clothes were glowing because his body was glowing and glowing through the clothes. 
Listen up to what I think is a crucial point about the transfiguration, with trans, with change in mind. During the transfiguration, Jesus didn't change who he was. Jesus did not change who he was and is in nature, only his appearance. It showed even more clearly who Jesus is. And I think, I was pondering this, there's a parallel between this and people who don't, don't identify with the gender that they were assigned at birth. Little or nothing then changes on the inside who they are at core, although they might choose to change their appearance by what they wear, what they dress in. And for some, through undergoing physical transition, change. As who they are becomes more and more clear to them, a changing appearance then makes this clearer to other people. The reflection this morning isn't just for people who are transgender, the T of LGBT, or indeed just for people who are the LGB, lesbian, gay, bisexual. I hope it speaks to all of us, because this account of the transfiguration of Jesus in the wider context of the whole of Jesus' life on this earth and his death and resurrection is so relevant both to this but to all of us as well. Each of us is unique, have you noticed? Each of you, you're unique, absolutely unique. I am absolutely unique, wonderfully made as we sung earlier. Each, as we sung earlier, individually knit together in our mother's womb. We are God's craftsmanship. You are an original as I am an original. And I think there is often an aspect of who we are that we try to hide from the world. Sometimes we try to hide it from ourselves as well. It's called repression. We push it into the unconscious. Why do we do that? Because of shame, powerful shame. Fear of rejection. What will people think? What would God think? As though God might be disapproving when it was God who made us in the first place. Sometimes it's because we've internalised a negative attitude about this key part of who we are. Because we're brought up in a culture which has so many prejudices and a lack of understanding about this, and or we have been part of a church which is just like that. As an adult, Alex says that they were told to get out of a church during a service when they were holding hands with their future wife, Jo. So what other, broadening this, what other aspects of who we are might this apply to, as well as sexuality and gender? Something else that is the essence of who you are. Something that can't be changed. For example, personality. For those of us who know a little bit about the Enneagram, our Enneagram type is fixed for life. You can become a healthier version, but the theory says it's fixed for, type, for life. Whether you're more introverted or extroverted, you can change in how you are, but I guess that introversion or extroversion can be with us for life. Neurodiversity, the different ways that the brain can work out and interpret information. People naturally think about things differently. They have different interests, different motivations, and are naturally better or not so good at certain things. Do you know who you really are? Do you feel free to be who you really are, to embrace who you are, whatever that may be, and have you always felt free in that way? A little bit of an overview of the passage we've heard today. So they're up on the mountain. Something absolutely key is going on. A really, really key revelation about who God is. Moses and Elijah, that which came before is fading. You can think of the prophets and the law, 
Think about the Old Testament, that which came before Jesus. But Jesus is here in person now, showing who Jesus is, what God is like. And during this transfiguration, these sleepy disciples see some of this. They don't know what to do. Are you like that when you don't know what to do or say? You speak anyway? Well, Peter was like that. The cloud appears, often a symbol of God being there on the mountain. This is my son, who I've chosen. Listen to him. And then they go down the mountain. So what about firstly discovering who you are? Did Jesus, let me ask you a question. Did Jesus always know who he was straight after his birth? The son of God. God in the flesh. The Messiah, the anointed one, the long-awaited Christ, the Messiah. Did he know? No. How weird would that be for this little baby, with a little baby's brain, to know all that? The incarnation means that he was fully human. And could a young child handle that kind of information at a very early age? No, I would suggest. I do think it would have started to dawn on him slowly, slowly. In Luke chapter 2, we hear that he increased in wisdom and stature. Certainly at a young age, the penny was starting to drop. Remember when he was age 12 in Jerusalem? His parents went back home. Ah, where's Jesus? Why were you looking for me? You knew I'd be in my father's house. Was it anxiety provoking for Jesus to start to discover who Jesus was? I bet it was. And of course, what it would mean being the Messiah, the rejection that was coming, the suffering, and yes, death. All that that he had explained to the disciples eight days before the transfiguration. How about you? putting the spotlight on God, on myself and on you, on all of us. Have you learned much about yourself over the years, who you really are? Not everybody does. Some people would rather not know. Some people don't seem to realise that actually it is part of being and living free. The beauty of living life to the full. Has it always been easy for you to accept who you are in your entirety? Everything that makes you you. Have you ever denied an aspect about yourself to yourself? Trick question because it's hard to know because if you've denied it and you're still in denial, you won't know because it'll be pushed into the unconscious. But maybe you've become aware of something that you have denied at an earlier age. For me, as mentioned earlier, it was repressing those emotions deep down and then suppressing them. Kind of being aware but thinking they're not socially acceptable. So pushing them down and down. What about churches? Spotlight on church. Well, we are the church, aren't we? Do churches, in your mind, help people discover who they really are at core? Has church always helped you to discover who you are at core? And let you be free to be you? Or, overtly or subtly... Has church encouraged you to hide who you really are? Helped imprison you? Stifled you? Made you very grey? Exerted a pressure to conform to what that church, what we might consider is the norm? I remember a number of years ago coming back from Le Paz Opton, Spring Harvest in France, and I thought I'd grow a beard. My daughters told me to grow a beard, so I did. And this was when beards weren't quite as trendy as they are now. And I went back to the church, and the number of comments I had, what you got on your face? Sometimes in church we think we have a right to comment. And we don't like change. But that can happen in more important ways as well. An extreme example, but not an uncommon, sadly, 
example. Conversion therapy, very much in the news at the moment. Thank God because the government are doing something legally to change the horrendous practice. Although many Christians are trying to stop this bill in its entirety. Thankfully, a good number of Christians are saying to the government, please see it through in its entirety. But when somebody identifies who they are, LGBT, and then others try to get God to change that person, the core of who they are, although it can't be changed, what can happen is it can be repressed again. What about women? in many churches who are gifted at leading, gifted at preaching, or would be if they were given a chance to, but no, you can't do that. Baptist ministers. Did you know there's a pressure for Baptist ministers to be extroverts? It's quite hard for a Baptist minister to be an introvert because there's a certain pressure to be a certain way, but thank God more and more people are allowed to be who they are. And the blessings of being an introvert or more introverted are shown as well. Worthing Baptist Church, we are learning to be a safe, nurturing, non-judgmental space. We want to celebrate who you are, yes, you and me. We want freedom to be who we are and express who we are, who you are. And we want to help you discover that even more. Not suppress, not repress, but celebrate. And secondly, what about revealing who you are? As Jesus became increasingly aware of who he was, he was wise enough who to reveal that to and in the timings of that. Sometimes depending on whether or not they could handle it and how they might react. For example, Peter, James and John, they kept it to themselves after the transfiguration for a while. But even with Jesus' wisdom and sensitivity, the reaction wasn't always good. In his hometown earlier, at Nazareth, when he preached in the synagogue, saying, everything is fulfilled in me, in your hearing, they tried to chuck him off the mountain. And his family couldn't accept who he was at first. Just before this mountaintop experience, when Peter declared, you're the Messiah, wow, the penny dropped, he got it. But even then, when Jesus went on to explain what this would mean, the suffering, the death, He couldn't accept it. Think about the mountain. Jesus was showing, this is the time to show my glory, my divinity, a time to reveal further. Showing his heavenly body. Alex in the book says this was Jesus' coming out story. Coming out in his divinity. What about you again? After you started to recognise a core aspect of who you are, for example, something to do with your personality, the way you think, the way you see the world, or something about your sexuality or your gender identity, or other things that might come to mind, how have you decided in life who to reveal to and when to reveal to that precious part of you, the essence of who you are? We hear Jesus saying, don't we, don't cast your pearls before swine because they get crushed. He's talking about the gospel, but it applies here. Sometimes this essence of who you are, we need wisdom in who and when to share in case they crush it. It might be wise to carefully choose who we do that to, like Jesus was, and how much. But there comes a time, I would suggest, I believe, to be free to be who we are. Sometimes it's hardest in the family. I get bet that resonates with you. Sometimes it's hardest to be you in the family, but it doesn't have to be. The Parker family, we're not saints, we're not amazing, we're just us. But when George, our youngest child, came out as LGBT about three years ago, George was engulfed in love by all of us. Thankfully, those who are Christians, and definitely by those who aren't. George felt able to come out because George knew our love. And actually, she'd seen Kate and myself go through the process of prayer, studying theology, and coming to that deep conviction that if you're LGBT, you're LGBT, and we celebrate that with you. 
And George has grown and blossomed since she has been set free to be George. It's rather beautiful. What about me? I said earlier, because of you I feel free to be who I am and tell you truths about our children as well with their blessing and their knowledge. My hope is that in this church, everyone more and more can be free to be who you are and all allowing freedom to others to be who they are in our increasingly diverse church. We are beautiful in our diversity. Thirdly and finally, reflecting the glory of God. Jesus, on another occasion, says to the disciples, you have seen me, so you have seen the Father. In seeing Jesus, we see what God is like most clearly. Indeed, in Jesus, I like this, with Alex's phrase in mind, in Jesus, God came out as to what being divine actually means and looks like in the flesh, in reality. Jesus revealed God's glory most clearly and the glory of God was revealed most clearly at the cross when God, through Jesus, in Jesus, displayed the extent of God's love for a few people, for everyone. Moses and Elijah, it's been said, shone with the reflected light of God. They saw God and it was on their faces. In Jesus, we see the eternal, uncreated light disclosed. The shadow came before in the law. It was fulfilled in Jesus. The trouble is a little bit like Peter, who wanted to stay on the mountain. Us Christians find it hard to move on and keep up with God. I would suggest, ever so humbly. What about you? You are image bearers. You were made in the image of God. Paul says we are to go from glory to glory, become more and more like God. More loving, in essence, more loving. Are you becoming? Are you becoming more loving? Because it's not automatic doesn't just happen, we have to be open to God. Martin Luther, Luther, in these beautiful words, says, This life, therefore, is not godliness, but the process of becoming godly. Not health, but getting well. Not being, but becoming. Not rest, but exercise. We are not now what we shall be, but we are on the way. This is not the goal, but it is the right road. At present, everything does not gleam and sparkle, but everything will be cleansed. Worthing Baptist Church, we often say it, is a school of silver feet at the cross to say, yes, I'm going to take a risk and be me here and let other people be them and grow together in this church. A place to blossom, a place to discover who you are even more, to become, and it's a cliche, but it's a good phrase, the best version of who you are. And you are, you are welcome as you are in essence. You don't need to change, you don't need to cover up. Your personality, your neurodiversity, your gender identity, your sexuality, whatever. You have freedom to be you. We celebrate you alongside you. I'm going to read you some words from Alex. Learning to fly. When I wrote about the start of my calling journey into ministry, I mentioned not feeling good enough. I think it had a lot to do with authenticity or the lack of it. I felt unable to be completely myself because I was hiding or downplaying the parts of me that might be inconvenient. Learning to run was about transitioning, about being myself, about allowing myself to be transformed into, well, me. Learning to fly, though, is about living in constant transition, being authentic about myself and allowing myself to be continually transformed by God without any set end, point or goal. I am enough. It's as simple as that. 
There's a very clever wordplay going on in Luke's account when he talks about Jesus discussing with Moses, Moses and Elijah his departure in Jerusalem, departure, exodus, death. Very clever link to the exodus from Egypt of Israel. When they were set free from captivity, Jesus glancing to the cross and the promise that we will all be set free in a much more everlasting way through his death and resurrection. The place where we find our freedom from sin and the consequences of sin. Ultimately, the sin in many ways is not listening to God. Poetically told in the story of the Garden of Eden, don't touch that tree, the voice of God. They didn't listen. We want our own knowledge of good and evil. This is being set right here. Can you see that? Didn't listen to God. What's God saying? Listen to Jesus. That's the reverse. Listen to God in Jesus. This is the message of the cross. To love God, to love other people, everyone, as we love ourselves. And that means not repressing your essence, who you are at core, but love whoever you are as you love the person next to you, in front of you, behind you, whoever they are. Let us pray. Lord, with all the competing voices 